Thank you, sir, for being so kind. And I'm sorry I went to the annexe first and then came back, and so we about five minutes delayed. Uh, it's a very interesting topic that, that uh, Professor Chaudhary has chosen, typical of him, you know. It's not about diabetes and diet. It's not about, it's about preventing diabetes. And they really like that. And the reason I like that is because when you talk of treating diabetes, if you all do that morning till night, the so-called epidemic of diabetes, the so-called sort of statement, India being the diabetes capital of the world, all those are sort of cliches that, you know, that, that we just keep talking about and dealing with. No country in the world with the present incidence and prevalence of diabetes has the financial wherewithal to handle the di diabetes and all its complications, not even individuals. I'm talking of countries as a whole. There is no country that can handle that. The good thing about diabetes, though, is that it can largely be prevented or delayed or minimized to a large extent. So when we talk of preventing diabetes, we are talking of two things here. We are talking of preventing complications due to diabetes. So supposing you've got diabetes and you want to remain free of all problems, that is preventing complications of diabetes, which is very important because diabetes has many symptoms. You know, if you have a high blood sugar, you may have 100 today, 200 tomorrow, you feel the same. But what we are worried about is the effect of diabetes on our various organs, which is why prevention of complications of diabetes is very important. At the same time, going a step ahead, what we call as primary prevention, prevention of diabetes itself is the biggest challenge. And really, if we can work together towards that, the society, the medical fraternity, the government, the research bodies, then really we can make some headway in, in, in saving India from this almost certain disaster that faces us. So let's go to the very basic stuff. I mean, we, you all know diabetes is high blood sugar. <laughs> it's in fact classified as sugar. People call it sugar. In fact, our chain of hospitals has started a chain of clinics called sugar clinics, you know, because that's the common man's perception of diabetes. But remember that diabetes is not just sugar. And I think that's very, very important to remember. That's the first lesson here. Diabetes is not just high blood sugar or just blood sugar. It has a strong vascular component, a component of blood vessel involvement. For example, the heart, which is the main sort of component. So diabetes and heart go hand in hand. That's why over the last few years, many of our meetings are diabetes and heart meetings where both cardiologists and endocrinologists sit together because it's almost inexorably linked, completely linked, diabetes and heart. So that's important. It is not just raised blood sugar. And then diabetes comes with other stuff. It's got its partners in crime, you know, which, which just hang around with diabetes and create further trouble for us. It is very commonly associated with obesity. We know obesity per se is a risk for so many things, it's a risk for heart disease, it's a risk for high blood pressure, so many things. So obesity accompanies diabetes all the time, or most of the time. Blood pressure. Majority of diabetic patients at some point or the other get high blood pressure. And cholesterol problems. So these are the three things that go. So if you want to complete the sort of four-pegged stool, you'll, you'll have diabetes, you'll have blood pressure, you'll have cholesterol, and you'll have weight, overweight. So these four components, so whenever we talk of treating diabetes comprehensively. It's not, you know, the doctor, if, if you are doing that and your doctor is doing that, you're going to the doctor getting a medicine prescribed for diabetes and bye-bye see you, that's not okay. You need to pay equivalent amount of attention to these associated problems because they compound the effect of diabetes. So unless you're treating your blood pressure properly, unless you're treating your cholesterol properly, and unless you're treating the diabetes properly, all three together, only then you will be able to prevent, protect yourself from complications of diabetes. And I think this is important. This is exceedingly important because all three of these produce no symptoms. So patients come for a health check, just normal, executive health check, sent by their company or sometimes on their own. Ek health check kara lete hain. You know, let's do a health check. And they suddenly find they have blood sugars that are 200. They find they have blood pressure that are 140, 90. They find their cholesterol is, 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 is 200 plus. Nothing is 
horrendously out of order, but everything is a little bit gone. And it's very difficult for a patient to comprehend when the doctor tells him at that point that, look, there is a big problem. There are multiple things happening. So the first reaction of the patient, and I will discuss patient reactions as we go along, is of disbelief. And they say this can't be. And how can all of it come together? Well, all of it does occur together. So I think that's something we have to keep in mind. There's also a term called pre-diabetes, which you need to understand, which patients and in lay language say borderline sugar. You know, there's a borderline values. You've got to be careful what is borderline. Borderline is actually if you're fasting sugars between 100 and 125 without any treatment, and your post-glucose sugars between 140 and 200. That is borderline or that is pre-diabetes. But if you're hovering at 130, 140 fasting, that is not borderline, that is diabetes. Okay? So we all naturally, it's human nature, to brush it under the carpet and say, I, I had blood sugar once, you know, it was 130, but I'm fine now. But actually, it doesn't go away. If you have diabetes, you usually have diabetes. It just requires good management, that's all. So if your fasting is between 101 and 125, and if you're after glucose, not after meal, after glucose is between 140 and 199, you are pre-diabetic. Okay? And if it's above these, then you're diabetic, clearly. Why is it important to diagnose this condition, use this term, pre-diabetes? Why is it important to diagnose it at all? I mean, why should you worry about pre-diabetes? Who cares? Pre-diabetes, you know? There are two reasons for, for pre-diabetes being important for us. One reason is that Per se, so-called pre-diabetes or borderline sugars predispose at, us to heart disease. So the diabetes heart link I was talking about is not as strong at this stage, but still nevertheless there. So if you're a pre-diabetic, if you're borderline, you still need to take care of your heart. And you still need to take care of obesity, blood pressure, cholesterol, the same way as you would as, uh, you know, if you were a diabetic. So that's the importance of pre-diabetes. At this stage also, our heart disease risk starts going up. So therefore, we have to pay attention to that. Secondly, a lot of these pre-diabetics, maybe half of them, or maybe more, some data suggests more, become diabetics. So you can prevent diabetes by intervening at this stage. So if in a health check or a routine check, you went for surgery, you had a blood sugar test done, it was okay, doctor said it's borderline, don't ignore it. If you don't have to take medicine for diabetes, that's good, but it doesn't mean you're not at risk. So you should make sure your other stuff, your cholesterol, your blood pressure, other things are looked after, and make sure that you don't progress to diabetes. And that you can do by usually by lifestyle measures and some medication if required. So pre-diabetes is very important for us doctors, and especially those of us who work now mostly in large hospitals which do health checks, it's very important to pick up these pre-diabetics and actually protect them, prevent them from becoming, frankly, diabetic and, you know, or, or getting into heart problems. Now, what is the traditional understanding for endocrinologists? You're normal, you're pre-diabetic, and you're diabetic. That's how it goes. Okay, and I told you one, you could have a problem with the fasting sugar, which could be between 100 and 125, or you could have, you know, your post-glucose sugar, which could be between 140 and 200, that is pre-diabetes. Uh, we won't bore you with this, but there is another type of diabetes, and the common diabetes you talk about, that is type 2. Uh, you know, most adults have type 2 diabetic. Exceptions are there, but 99% uh, of adults with diabetes will have type 2 two diabetes, which is adult onset, the second one, non-insulin dependent, often can be managed with diet and lifestyle and tablets. And there is both deficiency of insulin, that means your pancreas is not making enough insulin, and there is a deficiency in insulin action. So, ek to insulin kam hai, aur jo ban hai, wo pura kaam nahi kar par. So, the gates are locked for insulin to act on your cells. So this is type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, that is childhood diabetes. That happens, it's much rarer than, than, than type 2. But you hear of children getting diabetes and suddenly, you know, getting very sick. That is type 1 diabetes. Where the pancreas just packs up. No insulin, shut off. So you need insulin, otherwise you're gone. With insulin, these children have a good life. But insulin is mandatory. So there's no way anything else can work. And the problem is of acute insulin deficiency. Not of, not of any insulin resistance there. 
So why are we talking about diabetes? Why did Dr. Chaudhary choose diabetes? I don't know. And, you know, and I thought of why he chose diabetes for discussion today, other than the fact that he's, he's like a friend and guide to me. He also chose diabetes because I think it's an important issue for all of us. Why is a disease important for us? Why are we not talking about, you know, uh, some, some esoteric uh, disorder which, you know, which happens one in a million patients, you know, why? Because when we talk about a disease, especially with public, the disease, I think, has maximum impact if it is common, if it could have serious consequences, and if we could do something about it. If it is common and has serious consequences, can't do anything about it, you can go on talking endlessly. It's, it's mainly for the scientists to talk. But if diabetes is common, diabetes is serious, and everything can be prevented. At least the complications can be prevented largely. You can't always prevent diabetes, but you can prevent the complications to a large extent. Now, Indians have a strong uh, sort of history of, of, of being in love with diabetes. We always love our sweet, you know. So I think uh, uh, if, you, if you read carefully, descriptions of Charak are some of the best descriptions of diabetes. Remarkably accurate. He described both types, by the way. In 400 BC, if you go to the Jocelyn Clinic in Boston, which is the mecca of diabetes, you will find on the wall the history of diabetes. Charak is very prominent there, right at the beginning with the Greeks. And, and he described 17 different types of urine disorders. And Madhu Meh was one of them. That is sweet urine. Okay, and the diagnosis was made by tasting the urine, by the way, for a long time. You taste the urine, it tastes sweet, so you've got Madhu Meh. So, so I think Indians have a long history of diabetes, and it's been described beautifully, including type 1 diabetes. And some of the things he says starts around 40, occurs more in the rich, occurs more in those who are fat, occurs more in those who don't excise, still hold true. So that's, that's amazing clinical observation. But diabetes is hugely common in India. At least 40 million. I mean, those are big numbers, 40 million. Clearly largest number. So we pride ourselves on being largest democracy, largest this, largest number of diabetics in the world. Most rapidly increasing diabetes, that's worse than having large numbers. The curve is going up very fast. Look at the urban prevalence, 10 to 16. Now some, some uh, uh, cities are saying 20%. I mean, that's huge. Adult population, 15, 20% being diabetic, that's really something. So we need to address the issue very rapidly and very aggressively and very uh, constructively. And the age of onset is going down. That's the worst part. It's gone away from being a disease that strikes at 40 to something that starts at 30. And now we are seeing children with type 2 diabetes. We talked of children having typical type 1 diabetes, but we've seen a lot of children now who come with type 2 diabetes. That is, the age of onset of the adult diabetes is coming down. It's not unusual in our clinics now to see people who are 22-year-olds, 25-year-olds coming with typical type 2 diabetes. So I think that's, that's, that's disturbing. As I said, it can affect children too. And also the concept of obesity. For years, we followed Western concepts on obesity. They're the big obese people, but Indians are, are unhealthy because of the central fat. Even though if you look at their, 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 their body mass index or their height for, weight for height, they're fine. But most Indians I know, even, even our athletic Indians, even our cricket players, have, have slightly protuberant stomach. Compare the waistline of our champions with the, with the with, you know, with South Africans or others, and you'll find there's a difference of West Indians. You would find that, so we tend to accumulate fat around our tummy. It's just there. So that's the biggest problem. And that little lump that we see, that little sign of prosperity, that prosperous paunch, is the one that is deadly. Okay, so, well, Westerners are big built. They also have the ob big obesity. They have a different kind of obesity. We have lean obesity, apparently lean looking, and, and little tummies all of us have. So that's the biggest problem. That's an example of what I'm saying. This slide will show you that. Go from left to right, and this is where you find a lot of Indians. Lean arms, lean legs, and this kind of profile. Not unusual at all. This is a cartoon that has been sort of, uh, is not a real person. I mean, it's just showing transition. But the fact is that, like, this guy may well be normal weight, if you check his weight. If you see, he's, he's 60 kg, he's 5 feet 4 or something, you know, and he's fine. But actually, he's not. This is where the problem lies. It gets, he's not even really fat here. 
but the tummies come out. This is the bad fat that the Indians carry. So why do Indians and those are, of course, are, 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 are armed forces or police uh, men? You can see what a nice central uh, fat we have here. Uh, higher proportion of body fat. Greater central fat, greater insulin resistance. When you have more fat, then the insulin can't act properly. So whatever insulin your body is making is not able to work. So there's a problem. And other cholesterol problems that come with this. So central fat is a big issue. It's a big issue. And I think that one has to keep in mind uh, when we talk of diabetes in Indians. Why are Indians getting more of all this? I mean, what is this issue of central fat, insulin resistance? Probably genes, but my, there are lifestyle changes, clearly lifestyle changes. And I think this increase in weight of our younger generation, especially school-going children, is huge. There's lots of data from Delhi showing Delhi school children being really obese. And you, you're worse off because you're generally obese plus you have central fat, you know, more. So you're getting doubly hit. For initially, you were thin and you had central fat. Now you've got fat, fat, and central fat, you know. So it's a, it's a big issue. Why are people getting this? Definitely, we can't do much about our genes, so no point in discussing that. But we can do something about lifestyle. And really, lifestyle changes are the key here. Lifestyle changes in, in, in urbanization have made a big difference. Uh, it's, we love to call it westernization. I, I disagree completely. Westernization is a very small component of the whole thing. What about the fast food that, what, is, what about Indian fast food? I'd like to hear, I've never heard anyone get up and say, ban Haldi Ram, everyone people says ban McDonald's. You know, is, is that food healthier? No, Indian food, affluent Indians didn't have healthy food ever. We had healthy food because we were forced economically to have healthy food. We couldn't afford that. Affluent Indian, the, the descriptions of food in India were never healthy. Maybe many thousand years ago, but not in the last few hundred years. And clearly our Indian food as well as Western food, clearly the easy availability. If you ask me one point, more affluence, easy availability. Children can order food like in, in five seconds and deliveries within 20 minutes, otherwise you don't pay. Right? So, so therefore, I mean, it's too easy to do that. And that's the big thing. And, and some degree of affluence, disposable income. As children, we never had these choices. Our children have these choices. We never had a choice of ordering food, eating out. It was like a big, big luxury. It's common practice now. So I think there is a big issue there. So there is definitely, it's increased to urbanization, increasing affluence, and more facilities, more comforts, uh, which is good in one way, but bad in this way. So we've got to watch for that. Yes, there are issues about that. Uh, there are differences, but it depends on how you do it. If you use chicken and fish cooked properly, that's the healthiest food you can have. If you're gorging on red meat, there's a problem. If you're using butter chicken, because we do that to everything, you know, then it's as bad as anything. So that's the problem. So it depends on how it's cooked, sir. But otherwise, white meat, if it's cooked properly, is very healthy. It's very good protein. Now. We won't bore you with this, but just to tell you, there is a huge amount of work showing that this problem in Indian starts in the womb. When, when the mothers are pregnant, the children are already getting predisposed to diabetes. We won't bore you with that, but if you want discussion, we can do that at the end. So it starts there and goes through the life, through our lives. And therefore, we start very early, and the protection has to start from the mother. And you'd be surprised, but it's maternal undernutrition that's causing It's complex, and we can discuss that later, if you like. But it starts in the fetus, that's for sure. And my friend Yagnik from Pune has done amazing work on that, world-recognized work on how fetal origins of diabetes, how it starts in the womb. Uh, can you explain insulin resistance? Yes, can sir. Can we keep the questions later, please? No, it is I know, but, but if everyone asks questions during okay, okay. the lecture, at the end, you'll have enough. As a single line, I'll tell you that insulin deficiency means lack of insulin. Resistance means insulin is a normal hormone required for a body metabolism. Resistance means the insulin can't act on the cells. If it can't act, it's not doing its function. So the sugar is in the blood, but not going into the cell where it's required. It's not going into our body organs. It's remaining in our blood where it's harming us. The sugar should go on into our cells for metabolism, which is not able to do because there is insulin required for that. And the insulin that we have, there is resistance to its action. Because of that, we are getting into trouble. What so, is insulin? Insulin is a hormone, sir. <laughs> Insulin is the hormone that controls blood glucose, body metabolism, made in the pancreas. Okay. 
<coughs> so it's not just Indians. It's not just humans. Uh, this is Delhi report. Well, it's a media report, and I'm very skeptical of media reports because in my field, they mislead us more than the leaders. But I believe maybe this one is right. It's in midday, which says, canines fall prey to lifestyle bug. Vets report increasing number of diabetic dogs and blame bad food habits. So maybe this is really happening. You know, who knows? Because they eat the food that we eat half the time. So really, it's unhealthy. So we all agree, diabetes is common. It's very common in India. It's rapidly increasing, affecting all ages, and maybe even our pets. So we've got to be careful. But who cares? There's no symptom of blood sugar. I feel fine if I have 200, if I have 250. Why is diabetes serious if there's no symptom of blood sugar? It's serious because of the problems it can cause. What can it cause? We all know, I'm sure, at least those of us who are diabetic, we know that it can cause eye problems, it can cause heart problems, it can cause kidney problems, it can cause foot problems. So top to bottom, everything. And it can cause sexual problems. Erectile dysfunction is a very common component of diabetes. So all these things primarily happen because of the vascular, which means that diabetes chokes our nerves, uh, our vessels. So the blood flow to these organs gets reduced. So we are choking the blood. It's not reaching these places. In a very crude way, I mean, that's how all these organs get affected. Some are small vessels, some are large vessels, but basically it's a blood flow that gets affected to these organs, and therefore all these diabetes, the next slide is a bit scary. So don't, I mean, you know, the risk of blindness in diabetics is 25 times more than general population. Risk of kidney failure is 17 times more. Risk of amputation, I mean, that's really scary. Risk of heart attack is two to four times. But most of this is preventable. These are data from times when patients were not treated properly. These presume poor control, poor treatment, nothing. If you do it really well, you can bring all these to really as close to normal as possible. Very, very much, you can reduce these numbers, you know. But this is how it is. If you don't do anything, this is how it's going to happen. And that's what we have to understand. We are feeling fine today. I always explain to patients, treating diabetes is like buying insurance. You know, why do you, why do you contribute to your insurance every month, every year? Why do you do that? Because you want, you're worried about end of the road somewhere. You know, same thing with diabetes. If you control your diabetes, cholesterol, blood pressure well, you're buying insurance for your kidneys, for your eyes, for your heart. And I think that's how you have to look at it, really. Because it's a huge economic and social burden which no society can handle. So we agree it's common, we agree it's serious. But I have to show you that it's, is it preventable? Can we do anything about that? And that's the main thrust today. Is it really preventable? Is the disease preventable? Are the consequences preventable? The consequences of diabetes like heart, eye, kidney are clearly can be reduced to a huge degree by good control of diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol. No confusion. So we won't spend time on that. There, it's well established. You must have heard it, and it's very clear. But not just by diabetes alone or blood pressure alone. Or, or you have to do all three together. And it works beautifully. And also, the challenge of not taking medicine. If there are two people, two diabetics, one guy is, is, is really well controlled on medication. The other person is doing very good lifestyle, but not very well controlled, but won't take medication. The person who is well controlled is the one who will be much safer. So don't fight with medicines. They are your allies in your fight against disease. They are not your enemies. Fight with disease, not with medicine. No one wants overdosing. But clearly, the medicines that are developed for diabetes of any chronic disease are to help you. And please don't fight. Don't, that shouldn't be a goal in itself. Goal should be fitness. Goal should be achieving all the parameters that we would like to. It should not be just to avoid medicine. As a single goal, it's not good enough. It won't work. So who is at risk? Why should we prevent diabetes? We can prevent it in the population as such. But we, all of, some of us are more at risk than others. So who should be particularly careful about diabetes? Ethnicity, unfortunately, genetics, Indians. So first two are gone. We can't do anything about it. Let's look at the second list, the modifiable risk factors. Those of us who are more centrally obese are more prone to diabetes who have this fat around the waist. 
those who are already showing borderline pre-diabetic sugars, those who have had diabetes in pregnancy, women who have had diabetes in pregnancy are almost certain to get diabetes later on in life. That's very important. Sometimes they want to switch off after the pregnancy and forget it completely. It doesn't happen. You may, it may go away for one year, two years, five years, it will come back. Diet, physical inactivity, this we won't talk about uh, diseases, but diet and physical inactivity are other obvious reasons. <coughs> and if you look at this, it's a graph, not to confuse you, but this is increasing weight, very simply increasing weight. And this is this way you're increasing weight, and there diabetes is going up. As your weight goes up, diabetes goes up. So the graph keeps going up. You know, the incidence of diabetes goes on increasing as our weight goes up. So weight is a big factor in diabetes. Put it simply, the International Diabetes Federation issued this statement, obesity and physical inactivity are the most preventable risk factors for diabetes and could lead to more than 50% reduction in prevalence. Have a look at this. Just lifestyle. In prevalence of diabetes itself, not complications. So if we follow lifestyle measures, this rising graph will just crash down. So it's very, very important to realize the importance of lifestyle in this. This is a difficult slide, but anyway, I, okay, these are, this is incidence of diabetes. And I think most of us would understand bar diagrams. The left one is, is obese, the right one is not obese. Again, I'm, sorry, the left one is not obese, the right one is obese. Okay, so these, these three bars are in people who are not fat, the left three. The right three bars are in people who are fat, right? And the higher this bar, the higher the risk of diabetes. So if you're not fat, you're here, <coughs> right? And if you're fat, you're there. So why three bars? This, did, this is level of physical activity, okay? So if you're lean and you're physically active, the risk of diabetes is here. If you're lean and you're physically moderately active like most of us are, your risk is here. If you are lean and sedentary, doing nothing, then your risk is here, right? If you are fat and you are not active, it's right there. If you are fat and moderately active, it's here. If you are fat and if you are uh, uh, quite active, if you are fat and quite active, your risk is the same as a sedentary lean person. So it's fitness and fatness. I hope I make sense. So if there's an overweight person who is exercising regularly, has the same risk as a lean person who doesn't exercise. So you can reduce your risks quite a lot by, by exercise. That's the importance of exercise in this. Rather morbid, nasty cartoon, but I still put it. It's, it has a huge impact. This is the doctor. That's the patient. It's taken from the net. The cartoon says, what fits your busy schedule better? The, the executive, he's an MNC executive, the patient, who says, I have no time. I'm so busy, I mean, I'm traveling into Europe one day and you know, I'm sleeping on flights in hotels. So he says, the doctor is telling the patient, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? <laughs> okay, so, so that is the importance of exercise. Just to give you an example, we get bogged down by our weight. So supposing someone's ideal weight is 70 kg and that person is 90 kg today. Okay, so, I mean, the, the, the challenge is too much. The, the problem is overwhelming. So, well, how do I start? I mean, it's very easy for the doctor to say lose weight. How do I lose weight? I mean, what do I do? How, I'll, I can never lose 20 kg. So what we advise is it doesn't matter, lose 5 kg. Because there is so much data to show. Look at the, look at the top line. Just read the top line. More than 50% reduction in prevalence of type 2 diabetes after less than 5% weight loss in four years. So if you're 80 and you become, or let's say if you're 90, you become 85, you've done a great job, fantastic. You've reduced your 50% weight reduction, reduces relative risk, any whatever. So it really reduces drastically your risk of complications. So if you're really overweight, for medical benefits, even a 5%, 5 to 10 kg weight loss, we call it moderate weight loss, is very helpful. So don't get bogged down by the fact that I am 100 kg, I can never become 70, why should I try, it's not worth. You know, it's very depressing and it's very you know, difficult for patients. So if you reach 90, I'm really happy because you've reduced your risk of complications by two-thirds by just doing that. 
So the benefit of moderate weight loss is, cannot be overemphasized. It's very easy to advise patients to lose weight, very difficult to do it. And certainly almost impossible to lose weight like 20 kg. We say 20 kg overweight, go and lose weight. How does the guy do it? I mean, how will you do it? So, okay, if you lose 5 kg in 3 months, I'm really happy. Because health-wise, you've improved quite a bit by just 5 kg weight loss. I think that's how we look at it. But we have people like Winston Churchill, who never exercised, and we have Mark Twain, whose quotes I love. And I think I, I, these two are together on this slide. Every time I feel the urge to exercise, I lie down until it goes away, until the urge goes away. OK? So, and that's typical, Mark Twain. You've, you've read his, his real genius. And I love the second one. And this also applies to lectures, maybe. Be careful about reading health books. You may die from a sprint. Okay. Similarly, I mean, you know, better hear carefully. If, if there's some miscommunication here, you can really make a big mistake. So about health and health books and health lectures, one has got to be careful. But if you are like Mark Twain or this gentleman who's sitting under the tree, it's fall time in, 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 in the U.S., and the leaves are falling, they're changing color, or maybe in Kashmir. And he's just waiting and saying, maybe my blood sugar starts to fall too. You know, it won't happen. You'll have to just get up and do the exercise. There's no other way. And if you're really busy, at least increase your activities. Take the steps. It's a worn out sort of suggestion. Take the steps, don't take the elevator, but no one does it. You know, uh, do all those kind of things which, you know, go down. If, you have a, if, if, if you're living on two floors, go down every time, come back. Just increase your activity levels. That makes a substantial difference. And, and introduce structured exercise. Try and introduce, introduce 150 minutes a week, which is not so much. It's only two and a half hours a week. And most of us can do that much. Even the busiest people, like some doctors or some executives, even they can afford that much. So I think one should try and do just 150 minutes a week is good. And increase your activity. It's also not good that you exercise in the morning and then you're just completely sitting like a lump of lard in a chair all, all morning. I mean, I think it's good to sort of move around and increase your daily activities at home or in your office or whatever. Seek help if required. Go for a structured program. People like me who hate exercise but still do it, uh, the only way I do it is because I go to a program, I go to an instructor, and it's kind of inbuilt that I just have to do it. Otherwise, I don't enjoy exercise. There are people who enjoy exercise a lot. But I still do it because what do you have to do? You just Because it is inbuilt there, you just have to do it. And if the instructor is there, there are other people there, there's, there's an angle to it, you've got to go there, otherwise you'll be you know, missing. Why are you missing? Do whatever it works, whatever works for you. Some people like exercising alone, some people like the gym. People keep asking, what exercise should I do? You know, everyone asks me this question, anything you like. Change it, mix it, do a treadmill one day, do yoga one day, do walking one day, whatever you like. Then people will come and ask, yes, I do 50 minutes of yoga every day. That's a big, you've got to be very careful when a patient tells you that. Because that 50 minutes of yoga, maybe 30 minutes of just breathing, which is very good, but it's not exercise. It's very important to do breathing. It helps us relax, but it's not doing much for our cardiac thing. So you must have 30 to 40 minutes of exercise. And a lot of people who say they do yoga every morning, they just sit and do some kapal or some, or anulom vilom, just do the breathing. One hour and that's it. You've done your exercise for the day. That's not exercise. So yoga, the exercise part of yoga is important also as the breathing part. In this case, you've got to do that also to get the benefits of yoga. Uh, we won't talk about diet too much, but very broad guidelines. We won't go into diet specifics because then that becomes a two-hour session. Uh, we need to increase fiber intake. We need to reduce fat intake in all forms. How do we increase fiber intake? By using multigrain cereals, by using more of vegetables, by, by, uh, by, you know, those are the ways to increase. And, and whatever fruits are allowed, have, have fruits. Reduce your fat intake drastically. People go on discussing ad nauseum, which oil, this, that, but they won't reduce their fat intake. You know, they come and tell me, my, I only have olive oil, so I have, you know, just three proteins in the morning or something like that. You know, I mean, you know, the oil has the same amount of calories. The cholesterol may be less. So, so you have to reduce your fat intake. A recent study has shown the only thing that works for weight loss is reduction in calories. And one gram of fat has nine calories. 
So reduce your fat intake. Avoid sweets, obviously, if you're a diabetic, you'll avoid sweets. Fried foods, again, same thing, reduce fat intake. Limit intake of typical urban foods, refined flours, big problem. Refined atta is a big problem. The more maheen, the more refined, the more fine it is, the worse it is for us. The more you have white bread, naan, kulcha, you know, whatever stuff made of white, anything that looks white is bad, reverse racism, but that's how it is. In this case, the whiter it is, the worse it is. The grainier it is, the more coarse it is, like our villagers eat, that's the best. You know, so first you take out the choker from the atta, and then you pay a fortune to mix the choker back again in the atta. But that's how it's become, you know. Don't skip meals. Another typical thing is patients say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on a diet and I've stopped having lunch. That's the worst thing you can do because you will eat more at, at the next meal and your body metabolism will readjust. Take small and frequent meals. If you're on medicines, match the medicine in meal timings. Diabetics make this mistake very often of, of taking the medicine at the wrong time. We recently did a random survey of our diabetic patients in our OPD. 30% were taking wrong doses at the wrong time. You know, so that's important. And when you, people ask me, what should I do when I eat out? When you eat outside, what do you do? When you eat anywhere, you don't have to worry about it. Where you eat, you don't have to worry about it. So whether you eat outside or inside, eat it. So that's what matters. It doesn't matter where you eat, what you eat. Make healthy choices. Don't ex people experiment a lot with diets. Please talk to your diet counselor before you do that. People try all kinds of funny things. You know, they will give up everything or they'll suddenly go on total fat diets. I don't know, all kinds of... All studies show that a balanced diet is important. These fad diets that all our slimming centers advocate are not necessarily good for you in the long run. You may knock off a few kg in one go, but they will not, it will not be sustained. It's been shown very clearly. So you may use it as a bolus, like initial bolus, but you have to balance. Because if you're really overweight, you want to give it a push, you can try those things. But you have to maintain it on your own. And really fad diets are not good for the body. They won't help you maintain your weight. You really have to have a balanced diet with the correct amount of calories. And in the American cartoon, but I think it's nice, we'll be waiting for the day and reaching the last few minutes of my talk. Uh, we're waiting for the day when in school, this is a school cafeteria, okay? And these are children in school who are fighting normally over pizzas and burgers and what have you and aloo tiki. This is a boy is telling his, his friend, I can't wait for my high fiber, no trans fat, Glucose free, organic, all natural, none special. Okay? And, and the girl is saying, Yum, me too. So I think that's the ultimate utopian sort of situation one would like to reach when th we are that aware and that conscious of our diets. Last couple of minutes, in specific terms, who should test for diet? I'm not a diabetic. Should I test? Family history. If you go deep enough, in my experience, all Indians have a family history of diabetes. Maybe not your parents, maybe your Chacha, mama, anybody. If you look hard enough, you'll find diabetes. So I think all Indians should be tested. Over 30, you should be tested. Pregnancy, in pregnancy, that's, people are aware, we always test for sugars very carefully. If you're overweight, obese by Indian standards, 90 centimeters for men and 80 for women. That's really stringent, and people are trying to bring it down to 85. <coughs> you need to test for your sugars. Okay? And even in childhood. If we see, we see a lot of obese children, you know, 10-year-old child weighing 70 kilograms, not unusual these days. If you're an obese child and you have a family history, you must be tested for diabetes. So it starts at 10, 11 sometimes, 10, 11, 12. You've got to be careful. Don't wait till the... Till, similarly, if you're pregnant and uh, even if you don't have a strong family history, you're overweight, maybe you need to check right away at the beginning. Don't wait for the standard test at six months or something. You know. I think those are really important populations. Uh, just, just we, we talk of the last, this, the three strategies for prevention of diabetes, okay? We, these are, this is jargon, upstream, midstream, downstream, anyway. The idea is it can either be for the whole population. The ideal thing is everyone eats healthy. And you bring down diabetes crashing by like 50%. Maybe difficult though, isn't it? There's so many issues involved. Special high-risk groups, should the government and, and NGOs and all of us as responsible citizens target high-risk groups like children? If you target schools, you're preventing a lot of stuff later on. Healthy diets in, in schools, okay? And, of course, we should at least as individuals, those of us who fulfill those criteria and high-risk, should test regularly 
for, for diabetes, and I think that's, that's very important. Okay, last few cartoons, but I will spend one or two minutes on this because I think, you know, when you, when you are diagnosed diabetic, the attitude determines the outcome. It's very important, what's your attitude? And I find, if you ask me, and I agree with Professor Priyan Tendon always jokes with, with Nikhil and I that, you know, you guys are wasting your time. Diabetes is a disease of the mind. It's a neurological disease, it's not a disease of, why? Because it's the attitude that determines the outcome. Okay, most commonly I see a close, close your eyes, ostrich approach. You know, I couldn't be having a denial. Must be somebody else. Kuch nahi hota, I'm feeling fine, who cares? Yes, sab doctor aise karte hai, aaj kal pura industry ban gaya hai, pura wo hai, corporate hai, commercialization hai pura, kuch hai thodi na, mujhe to kuch nahi hai. I feel fine, why should I worry about it? So, ostrich approach, shutur mur ki tarah, gardar niche kar liya, dekha ga, aarega, aaj kal aaya ga, dekha jayega. I have no symptoms, why should I care? It's very natural, actually. If I have no symptoms, you know, I don't care. If I have no pain, I don't worry. But you do have to care. Blame it on stress. Everything is related to stress. You know, wo office stress se ho gaya, ya my spouse gives me, I hear this so much. It's because of him or her that I got diabetes. <laughs> you know, this is not unusual. In a doctor's chamber, this is very common. Because he or she gives me so much stress. Doctor, it's the problem is there, not with me. You know, so stress can aggravate it, but it can't really make you diabetic. Okay. Blame the laboratory, very common. These labs are all wrong. That day, you know, they, I don't believe this lab. So uh, I, have se uh, I have seen people spending months in this. The lab was wrong, I'll, you know, it's, it's just not okay. And you'd be surprised, but lying about sugar levels is not uncommon to us. People, when we <laughs> insist on diaries and charts, it's not at all unusual to find someone faking their diaries and charts because they want to please you, you know? They, it depends on how close you are. If you're very close to you, he really wants to please you. He wants to say, I've done a good job. So they will fill in fudge in numbers and then it's not unusual. Even today I found somebody like that. Okay. So the fear, of course, is lifelong restriction. And I can empathize with that completely. See, you may want to follow all healthy things, but someone tells you to do that, it's very difficult to do it. Because restriction is something for the human mind that's a state that's alien to us. We don't like, you know, we want to be free. We're a free country. So who is this guy to tell me, you know, don't do this, don't do that? Why, why shouldn't, you know, switch off from that whole part of your life? Don't think about it. It'll go away. But it doesn't go away. This is important. People waste years ignoring fa fear of medicine. I already mentioned. And sometimes they're really scared. Some people get so scared of the consequences that they're paralyzed into inaction. Oh, my God, now I'm gone. My kidneys are going to go tomorrow. I mean, they, they, they really can't take positive steps, you know. So it, ha it is... We've, this is purely from my personal experience, you know, and I think we really have to work hard on this. As doctors, as healthcare providers, we need to provide much more support to our patients. Some of us are working on that through various agencies, through various forums, we need to do that. Uh, last few cartoons, I promise is the end. Uh, this is a patient telling the doctor. Okay, I'll read it out for you. Patient telling the doctor. Uh, this is not a question which is a cartoon. This is real. I mean, this actually happens in real life, almost in so many words. Be honest with me, doc. How much longer can I go on ignoring your advice about checking my blood glucose? <laughs> we do have some time, or is it really urgent now? I should start today, or maybe another year will pass, and then I can start. It's not unusual people to, uh, for people to ask these questions, you know? So this is what happens. And this is not unusual either. And if you look at this cartoon carefully, this gentleman is in the bakery confectionery shop, planning to pick up some stuff, and the image of his doctor is looming in his mind <laughs> with a stethoscope and, and his uh, prescription pad and everything. And this is not unusual. If I go or my endocrine colleagues go into the doctor's lounge at, at, at Apollo Hospital, we get the choicest abuses if I go there at lunchtime. Because my colleagues who are diabetic, they say, no, we can't eat properly. But I said, I'm not saying anything. But you just make us uncomfortable. You make us uncomfortable. It's, it's really, it's not an exaggeration. It happens all the time. This guy's come, now we got to, you know, it's, it's all very uncomfortable. You know, we just wind up, you know, do something else. So those are things. The last is, how do you find the right doctor? Okay, it's most diabetes should be treated by general practitioners, rightly so, or by internists, by physicians. But there are diabetics who require specialized care. And it's good to have some specialized doctor in the loop, even though you may be seeing your GP. 
it's not always easy to see endocrinologists. They're busy and you know, they have high fees and there are a lot of things. So you may not want to go to an endocrinologist all the time, but you need to have some endocrinologist at the apex of your care, who you may see once in six months, maybe. I think that's important, okay? So these days it is Jones, Jones and Jones, practitioners in jungle law. Okay, everybody is a diabetic specialist. Everybody in Delhi is a diabetic specialist. Everyone wears nice ties. Everyone wears, speaks good English. How does a patient figure out who is a specialist or not a specialist? They work in good air-conditioned hospitals, but most of them are not specialists, which is fine. But you need to know whether you're seeing a specialist or a generalist. And most of, the, most of you can manage generalists, but you shouldn't be under the impression that you're seeing a specialist, which most of my patients are, but actually you're seeing a general physician. And remember, you need to partner with your doctor. It's a life partner relationship. Huh? It's really like a life partner because it's going to stay there. I always give the example of coach and player. You see, diabetes is not like malaria or typhoid. I give a medicine, you're fixed, you go home. Diabetes is something that's going to stay, and you have to play the game. I can help you with that. But it is a little bit like Gary Kirsten and MS Dhoni. You really have to, it's Dhoni who has to play whatever Kirsten might say, right? So really diabetes is something going to be with you all the time. You have to manage it. We'll help you wherever required. If we fail in our job, you can change doctors, but you need to make sure your job is well done, okay? So what is a specialist in diabetes?